The WSR speaker series highlight women scholars and showcase their expertise in their respective fields. Women's studies and religion, we offer a certificate here at the GTU for any GTU student to provide an opportunity to focus some of their studies on women and religion. So we have available an intent form on our website, which uh, Diane will post a link to the WSR GTU website um, at the, throughout the course of this series, the speaker series today. And um, if you're interested, fill out an intent to enroll form. Um, it's just a way to let us know for you to tap into our program and to let us know um, the opportunities that we provide here. Without further ado, I would like to officially welcome Dr. Kersey Sterna. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correct, correctly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, she's a woman uh, scholar here at the GTU. And I will provide an opportunity uh, throughout the course of her um, time with us today. She will share with her, you more about her research. And as we begin all of our time um, with the scholars that graciously join us, I would like to begin um, by asking Dr. Kersey, could you share your thoughts on uh, the continued importance of women's studies and religion more broadly in this particular time with our cultural climate and the open embracement, embracing of racism and white supremacy and the global pandemic from your perspective as a scholar and professor? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great question and thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thank you all who, who are here. I was talking to you earlier and I had muted myself. So here it is. Hello. The many familiar faces here from my classes. So um, I wrote down some notes on my phone. My printer is not working. Uh, why is it important to even have women's studies, uh, courses with that title women or certificates or events because we are not there yet. Mm. We are not there yet where we would assume that we are all uh, on the same pay, uh, base in terms of thinking, what does it mean to be human being and what rights do we all have as human beings? Uh, there are still so many voices and stories uh, of human history to be uncovered that we simply don't know. And we know that the more we know of, of human history, uh, past, present, uh, it, re it, it reaches all of us. It changes the questions, the way we live our lives, the way we interact. Uh, the stories are waiting to be uh, uncovered. Um, so that's in terms of history. And, and the whole question of how much work we have done and how much still needs to be done in order to include women's varied experiences in the different disciplines like how do we do history how do we do theology how do we do ethics how do we do pastoral care not just assuming that what we inherited from the past is equally applicable now that we have a um, uh, situation has changed uh, for instance in theology uh, I'm, I'm mostly theologian who does history we are still in this battle of what language to use, whose experience of voice matters, and what sources we still need to keep reading and re-examining, that whose experience matters when we make those decisions. And have we figured out how to talk about God yet? Obviously not. So there's so much still, depending who are your conversation partners and how much work there's still to be done, even to name the importance of, of naming women and not just assuming that all women are similar, <laughs> no, and, and, and claiming the, uh, the importance of human experience in all we do, especially in theology. So there's so much work to be done on theological anthropology, uh, rewriting history, uh, hermeneutics, methods, um, the explosion what has happened in, in our methodology with feminist and womanist work, just mentioning two, two uh, approaches where women's experience has been the starting point. Uh, we are we are nowhere in the end of the rope. We are we are in the middle of very exciting times, and I would say that naming naming different isms, sexism, racism, classism, ageism, you name it, they are somehow related. There there are these connectors. So as a as a feminist scholar, uh, I am peeling the onion from my angle 
and I'm aware of how when I'm disclosing sexism or androcentrism or in, in the sources I study, there is a connection to other forms of isms in the past and in the present. Um, I'm looking at my phone here. Why is it important to still use the word women in our study and work is um, it's also a practical matter. It reminds us of the of what's oh, how it is. Let's talk about human trafficking. Or what does it mean to walk on the streets of Berkeley at night when you're a woman? We live in a world where my experience is different from my husband's. And why is that so? So there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that our streets are safe, regardless of of of, of your of your sex and gender. Um, knowing the daily um, crimes against women, against their bodies, trafficking is one example. Knowing that it is ongoing, happening as we speak, I want to think that what we do in scholarship that it matters. In, in supporting ways to change the world and change the streets we walk on. So we give the ideological impetus and, and content and empowerment to, to do something. And how to raise healthy children, women's studies, whether we have our own children or not, we are on the larger scope um, providing ways to educate the young about how to think of themselves, of their bodies, of their minds, of their souls, and what their rights as human beings are. So I see women's studies relating to many other areas where we are doing important justice work in theory and in practice. I hope some of that makes sense. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Could you tell us um, about your work on women as confessors of faith in the 16th century? You have published on this in the past and you're working on a new book as well. Can you tell us about what changes you have noticed in this area of women's studies? Yeah, I wanna share an image here first. Mm, can you see that? There's a cover, let me see, slideshow, way from start. Not to worry, I'm not showing lots of slides here. Just, can you all see that? So I think it's maybe helpful to talk about what I've seen happen by, by talking about this in light of the two books I, I prepared. So in about, in the 1980s or 90s, I had this idea that I really would like to know what did women do as, uh, as theologians? How did women experience their spirituality and write about that? And were there any women worthy of reading and studying as a university student? And in the 1980s, the answer was no, women didn't write. And that's all we care about if they wrote something. And if you want to look at Reformation period, which is my main, main period, late medieval Reformation period, in terms of the history I work with, uh, it seemed like there was no interest or reason even to start digging because we did not know if they ever did anything that was significant. And so that bothered me for a while. And well, I wasn't interested in looking at household, households and housewives because that was the assumption that the only thing we would know about Reformation women is the wives of the famous pastors. And um, so then I was teaching in Gettysburg Lutheran history and my students were asking that really, we, were, there, were there any women? Because we're kind of curious about that. So that gave me the impetus to return to my original passion that I want to know how women dealt with Reformation and, and church and what was their agency and all that. And I didn't even have the language or methodology in 1980s. Uh, I didn't have, I didn't know how to. So thanks to my students, I, I had this crazy idea that why don't I write a little booklet for our class, the women of the Reformation. And uh, I had written my dissertation on a medieval woman, Santa Birgitta Sweden, because she wrote in Latin. So that was approved as a good theological source because she was studying somebody who wrote in Latin. OK, but that was the Middle Ages, no Italian Reformation. So I thought I will prepare a little booklet for my students. And I went to northern Germany, Wolfenbüttel, this wonderful library. And I discovered that I'd been fooled, that even though it seemed that after Middle Ages, the women authors, the visionaries, the mystics, which was the way women could write theology in the Middle Ages, if you're a mystic or visionary, God forced you to do that, that you no know, women writers and women uh, leaders of the Reformations did not disappear. They just wrote in different genres. 
they wrote letters, they participated in, in different discussions, uh, they did a lot of groundwork by hosting uh, discussions around the dinner table, they raised children, they, they claimed their role in the Reformation story as mothers of the church. So they took what was taught by the reformer, reformer theologians that the new, uh, the best calling for a Christian woman is not to go to convent or, or become a visionary, but to become a really good mother, spouse and a mother, and that is a holy calling. And that was really good news for, for many people that actually that's a good calling to be a mother. But these mothers, many of them took the motherhood to mean something more. It meant for them, a role in the affairs of the church and society. So I discovered the book on the right, Women and the Reformations. Uh, it introduces 12 women, if I remember right, 12 women who I had not known. I had known about Katharina von Bora, who's Luther's wife, but I had not known of any of these other women. women. But thanks to my time in that library and finding sources that women actually were active and then putting it together, my little booklet became to be a very dense book with very small font because we discovered a gem. We discovered that, oh my gosh, there are all these sources just waiting for us to look. So I'm a theologian and I wanted to write about women and theology in the 16th century, but we were not there yet. This book came out 2009 and I, um, I must confess that and I faced my limitations in my training in terms of methodology, uh, combining gender studies, feminist scholarship, history, theology, I felt somewhat lonely in that. And I'm gonna to return to this question uh, later as you're thinking, how can one learn from um, my experience if you are interested in work like this. So, but in order to study women's religion and faith, we first had to know who were they, what were their names, where did they live? We need to do the basic biographies. So the first book really introduces women as, um, through the lens of vocation, how women found their Christian vocation with Protestant theology. And I look at women in different parts of Europe uh, in that. So then what has happened since? Well, it's 2022 now. We are there yet already that we have um, multiple sources to choose from. You don't have to go to Germany. You can actually um, stay in the United States of America if this is where you are today and go to library and you can, you can find basic history, you can find some interpretation, you can find women's sources in critical editions and in translation. There's a series from University of Chicago called The Other Voice, and it is an excellent series, The Other Voice. Uh, that has come to be in my lifetime. It wasn't there when I was a young student, I wish it had been. So I'm talking really fast here. So, where we are now, this book on the left, um, Women Reformers uh, of Early Modern Europe, you notice that the first title, the first book's title is Women and the Reformation. The second book, 10 years later, claims women reformers. Not just women and reformation, but women actively as reformers. And in this, we include biographical texts, uh, introductions, but also samples of women's own writing and, and some contextual articles. So that's the big development that we've gone from, we don't even know who we would look for, where the sources are, to there's a lot of sources to be studied and we can now actually teach. We have textbooks that we can, we can craft a class and we have a textbook. We don't have to do it all by ourselves. And another big development that has happened is um, that the constant need to, for an apology. Like some of my Reformation women, they cited their letters that they knew were gonna be published as my apology, but ever since I started to, to, uh, to play with women, so to speak, instead of choosing to work on Augustine or Luther, but, but spending time with women, I felt significant resistance from historians and from theologians, not from the feminists, uh, that you can't really do that, that you can't do theological study with this because, because, because. And that was exhausting for about 20 years to always defend, whether it was a presentation or an article, to defend why this matters. Like in this space, I think we all 
consider these matters, but many spaces that is not a given. But I feel like we're finally getting to place when a person can work with women subjects in, in this period without exhausting themselves in an apology of why this even matters. Um, if I had a chance, I could show you very quickly and then I stop talking for a second. Um, can you see this? So that this new book, just to tease you a little bit, it's gonna come out in October. We have um, chapters that cover different parts of Europe. So the focus here is more the linguistic diversity and cultural diversity rather than the vocational diversity, <laughs> uh, the, the vocational options. So we have women um, from different parts of Europe here, or the super central Europe, as people who wrote significantly or who had a, a very significant role as a publishing uh, woman reformer. Then uh, I looked at what's happening in Germany. Who were the leaders there? How did women express their leadership in reformations? There are There is wife of Luther, but there are also uh, women in ruling positions uh, included. And all these chapters are written by other people, not me. I, I got to do the dream team putting together. I got, to, I got to put together a dream team of international scholars where everybody writes from their strength, from a woman that they have, they have worked with. We look at England and my previous book didn't have a chapter on England. I, I, I left that out, unfortunately. But, um, and then we go to France and Italy, the Dutch, Swiss, the Anabaptist, and we have a couple of chapters explicitly on how Protestant women dealt with the Bible. Although Bible is part of every chapter, but these are particular chapters focusing on biblical interpretation by women. And then these are very interesting chapters. Um, women and theology, marriage, working women. And then this chapter by Karin Borlicki, reading textiles as text. Uh, Karin Bolicki, uh, she is a director of the fashion archives uh, in uh, Shippenbrook University, and uh, she looked at portraits of Katarina Mopora and, and did detective work looking at what kind of yarn is used, what kind of silk is used, and if she used silk yarn for her cap, what else happened? And she tracks women's roles in business, in politics, in, in culture through a, um, a particular lens she has with her expertise to look at the portrait of Katarina and what she was wearing. Oh, it's, a, it's a fascinating article. It's my favorite of the whole <laughs> of all the articles. And then uh, last but not least, a variety of thematic chapters where we look at how women negotiated the reforms. We have women who resisted nuns and we have royal women who did all in their power to, to stop the reformation, particularly in Scandinavia. And uh, then the last chapter by Jonathan Reed, who's an expert in Margaret uh, de Navarre, talks about what, how the whole reformations looking at France would not have happened without women and children. Like, so the book ends there that if you're not convinced already having read these chapters, the last chapter really makes a point that it's, un it's unfathomable that we have history books of reformation in France and England and, and women leaders are either left out or just mentioned as a spouse. It makes you really mad. So we, we are rewriting the, the textbooks. So of course, sometimes I hear the question, well, why, are, why are you doing that? Because we are already there where everything is inclusive. All the syllabus is, is, is inclusive, all the, but they're not, they really are not. So we still need books specifically on women why we need books that are uh, keeping it together. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing what brought you to this topic and how much, much things have and have not changed as far as representation and scholarships. Scholarship, do you have suggestions for those of us who wish to focus on topics that may currently be marginalized in scholarship, as well as any other advice concerning research strategies and publications? Yeah. Um, I think it's really important to A, follow one's passion. Like if this, any, any particular aspect of women's studies gets you going, 
then don't give up on that when you meet resistance. Don't give up on that and, and be very discerning when people give you advice on your career and your publication project. Be very wise, who are you listening to? Uh, if somebody tells you this is a career suicide, well, that was told to me too, but it wasn't, but it definitely was difficult. It would have been much easier if I stayed with Luther all 100 years I've been alive. Um, so choosing partners and trusted mentors who, who will help you make connections with people who are already working with the kind of sources you're working with and who can help you with the methodology. Like I have worked very much alone. The programs I went were not really, uh, I wouldn't say they were not woman friendly, but there was no program. There was no certificate. There was no cohesiveness. We were all on our own. And we were lucky to find professors who supported us and allowed us to do. Two of my closest uh, advisors were men who, who admitted that I don't know how to do this, but I think you onto something. You have my full support. And then they critique my writing just as a, like, does it make sense or not? But to have a sense of who is working on similar themes and how, and get, get, get that kind of support and, and critique. There's another temptation is I think to, and this is more with my women theologian uh, colleagues that we are so, it was so important for us to say that my voice, I do, and that's already really great, but then also to be willing to take critique. Like, yeah, everything I say is golden, but really scholarship is solid when it's critiqued and vetted and, and, and have that kind of humility also. Why not be crushed when somebody says, I don't think this is important at all. So networks, connections, looking at schools where, where programs are offered, like for, for future jobs, like if this is going to be, and another thing that if, if a woman focused work is, is it going to be your main dish or your side dish? Is it going to be your hobby or what you want to be known for? So that then determines how you invest your time with other projects. And I think there are more jobs today than there were maybe 20 years ago for people who can focus. Uh, let's say I would be only working on women and reformation 16th century. That's all I do. I believe I might get a job, but what has helped me and I think would help somebody else to, I guess say you're applying for a job and the school wants you to teach what is your expertise, but they also need you to teach basic history or, you know, or some general course. So to keep those credentials up there too, and have something to prove that yes, because it's not uncommon to be asked like, well, do you even know who Augustine of Hippo said? Yes, I do, even though I don't quote him all the time. <laughs> so there's a little kind of you know, mansplaining. So connections and, um, and uh, keeping it up, if this brings you joy, don't give up, but, but being wise about how do you market yourself that you can, you can then get a job to teach also other things. Um, what else would I want to say? And the method really, because when we publish, it's, it is important to think ahead that which publications are the kind that you are reading for your work and where you would like people to read your work. And sometimes you may be invited to write an article and you're tempted to say yes, but then you think, do I, do I want to be published in that? because everything we publish, it's going to stay with us. I mean, it's going to be, it's our, it's our face that, okay, she's publishing with them and them and them. Um, conferences, going to conferences, getting funding to go, and the, nothing compares meeting people in these smaller conferences or, or events where you can actually talk to people. And, and I would not be shy as a younger scholar to go to an older, whether in age or, or teaching years, to, to introduce it. I am really interested in that. Could we have a cup of coffee? Can we talk? I have found such generosity from people when I've asked that and just go and say, hi, or send an email. So not to be shy and be alone, but, but allow people to uh, support you and sometimes but be bold and make, it, make the initiative. But the conferences really are important. The con conferences, I found them really important. Thank you so much.
literacy. It was very rich and informative, especially just learning about Reformation and the women's contribution to the Reformations. That's just something that is not readily taught, you know, in universities just across the world that I have found and have come across in my you know, tenure as a, well, in my time as a scholar. So what I want to do now is turn it over to my colleague, uh, Diana, and she's going to lead us in the question and, question and answer portion. Thank you. Thank you, Kiana. <clears throat> Thanks, Kiana. And thank you so much, Dr. Sterna. It's an amazing lens that you've opened up for us today. Um, so I'm Diane Saunders, and I am the program coordinator for the Women's Studies in Religion Certificate Program. Um, I'm also a first year PhD student in historical and cultural studies with an emphasis in art and religion. Um, and so we're going to open it up for questions. You can put questions in the chat, or if you can use uh, your reactions and raise your hands. Um, I'll be watching for them. And I'll start off with a question, if you don't mind. Um, I'm just, I think it's just such a fascinating uh, lens that you have opened up. And, you know, I'm coming at it, my, um, my faith tradition is Catholicism. And I'm particularly interested, you know, within Catholicism, uh, women religious have had such agency for study and scholarship and voice and contribution, uh, but yet mothers haven't, <laughs> you know, and so lay women, it, it's been a kind of a muted voice. Mm -hmm. And so I was just would love any reflections you have on that as far as, you know, just the, um, the bridge through the Reformation into women's agency and voice within family life and just the development of that. And, and, and I would guess I would say the fruits that it is it has contributed um, within Christian history. And especially as you say, family life in the passing on of faith, mm -hmm. um, the role with, with children and uh, so, you know, I, I would just be interested in some of the dynamics that were helpful in opening up that avenue for women mm -hmm. and that contribution, the fullness of contribution and that relationship to motherhood and family. Mm. Yeah, that's a great, great, great opener for we're gonna have a great conversation. Let, let me let me start and then interrupt me if I'm not going the direction you wanted me to go. So before, one of the biggest, when the reformations happened in Europe, the Protestant reformations, there were two visible things that, that you, if you walked your new, new town, you would know Im immediately that you are in a Protestant town. And that would be in worship life, people would use vernacular, meaning that everybody would understand, including the women, the mothers would understand what's going on in the church. And there would be communion offered in bread and wine, and everybody is included on the to the communion. Men, women, children, everybody receiving the whole deal. That would be a visible sign. We are in a Protestant church. And you can already see there that how did that impact women, that they are invited to the altar to receive the bread and the wine, and they hear preaching that you are as holy as the priest. What? Or you have babies, you are as holy as the Pope. What? I mean, this is like people had not heard that. Women and lay people had not heard that kind of proclamation that the Bible says you are holy, you are in a holy vocation as you are, you are welcome. This, of course, didn't mean that suddenly all the doors would open for women. We're still living in a patriarchal uh, European context where very much of the Reformation success depended on reformers playing ball with the societal system, meaning let's not shake everything. So the patriarchal family orders remained, you know, that, that didn't just change overnight. Another visible sign that you are in a Protestant town is that your pastor was married. Your pastor had a wife, a legal wife, and they would have children who were legal children. And you would, so, okay. So you know you're in a Protestant uh, context and, and you women, women are more visible in their so-called ordinary professions. 
And the contrast I'm trying to make here is that if you go to a, a Catholic city, late, late Middle Ages, um, who are the holy women in spiritual leadership positions? We would talk about sisters in convents, abbess. We know of powerful women leaders in the Middle Ages, Hildegard, or even not Middle Ages, but, uh, Sister Tecla, abbess of the Brigitine sisters in, in Rome, apparently it was a pretty powerful lady and was whispering to Paul, uh, Pope Paul uh, very powerfully that we should make Mary the co-redeemer. Co I mean, I mean the, the abbess's function has been so important and, and the calling for women to go to convent where you can learn to read and write and, and you have a, a spiritual role. With Protestant reformations, that role was gone. Mm -hmm. That was a, a battlefield. What do we do with the convents and women who actually like that kind of lifestyle, who have no desire to have babies, uh, who, who want to dedicate their life to that kind of calling? And it seemed that women leaders, when they were in a position to decide what will happen to convents, they had more mercy saying, let's just let the women do what they want to do. If they don't harm us, but let's not build new convents. That was one of the big losses uh, for, for, for women in the Reformation, that that convent option became a no, no, no go. That, that, I think that was a loss. While at the same time, those women who had been placed in convents against their will or who had no other way to make their means or who thought that that is a better calling than being a mom, well, for them, then that was like, I'm good, I'm married. There's a really interesting battle between two of the two of the women in Geneva, Marie Dantier was a French uh, um, speaking uh, nun who left her abbess, took a little cash with her because she had to pay for the bus fare. <laughs> and she went to Cal uh, Calvinstown, Geneva, and she married and was very happy, was reading her Bible, interpreting Bible, publishing, writing to Queen Margaret de Navarre in France, a very powerful biblical interpreter and author whom Ca Calvin dismissed. Anyhow, Marie's, uh, Pep, pep peeve, is that how you say that? A major irritant was that there was this nunnery, the convent, where the, the, the women were not leaving. And she personally made trips there with, with fellow Protestants and forcibly trying to remove sisters from the convents. And the sisters put on the fight, they put the slippers on fire and there was some physical confrontation and shouting and people calling each other with bad names. And we see this class that what was good news for Marie who says, it's so wonderful to be married. Why don't every woman want to do that? And Jean de Jouzy, the abbess says, uh, no, thank you. I don't want it. So talking about women's agency, to me as a Protestant woman, uh, that was very eye-opening that, oh, not everybody wanted to, wanted to, somebody else told them what their calling in life is. But okay, so, so back to the Protestant context. So we don't have sisters, we don't have abbesses, we have mothers. And we have women who are not married. They would stay with families. They could be teachers. Um, uh, the holiness then, the, the vision of holiness and, and, uh, and uh, spirituality, it's, it centers around what's happening at homes, where you are mother, where you're father, uh, that, that is like the other church. Right. Yeah. So the, the, the lay woman uh, would be considered having her own spiritual role in her domestic calling. Mm -hmm. Now, that wasn't satisfying for everybody. For some, it was like Katharina von Bora, Luther's wife said basically that I am really busy. She had no interest writing theological treatises or anything. She was teaching and cooking and managing. And, 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 and that reminds me of what I wanted to mention that the, the role of women in teaching their children and others' children so the housewife actually is a pretty big, pretty big office. Being a housewife meant something big, not just like, oh, a little housewife. What is a little housewife? I don't know. I never met a little housewife. I think housewives do a lot of work. <laughs> that is <laughs> vital. But um, what was I going to say? Mm, something about the home. Ah, I forgot. Uh, another interesting thing happened with, uh, with the Reformation is what happens with, the, with prostitution because our reformers thought that now that everybody will get married and have happy sex at home, we don't need prostitution anymore. Which meant that the brothels that had been inside city walls were closed, which meant that women in that business would 
be forced to freelance or work with a very dangerous uh, uh, male uh, partner outside the city walls. And so that pr profession became imminently more dangerous. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. So would you say just the access to learning um, would be, I mean, language would have been a big part of it for mm -hmm. women the, in the mm -hmm. vernacular. Yeah. Um, but any other, yeah. you know, that, that, ability, that, that access to learning yeah. um, in a theological yeah. level. Yeah. So, yeah, because um, one of the, we, when we talk about reformation, we typically think of, oh, it was the new teaching of how one is saved and the sacraments. And, but really, when we look at the first very concrete changes that the Protestant reformers caused, brought about were um, making sure that everybody understands what's going on in worship, that everything used in worship has to be in the vernacular language. Bibles need to be translated into vernacular language so that anybody at least theoretically would read them. But also public schools. Everybody receives basic education to read and write so that they can read their Bible, but also that they are equipped in their vocation in the society. So whether you were a peasant girl or, 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 um, or a city dweller, your kids were supposed to go to school. So you already have that, that everybody has that, that, that access to information available combined with the timing of the uh, printing press. It's like the web, World Wide Web was suddenly available, that there are pamphlets around and, 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 and materials that you could actually get your hands on. And women had access to these. Of course, it took a long time for everybody to learn to read. One of the, uh, so I'm from Finland and, uh, and uh, we, our reformer, Mikhail Akrikola, studied with Luther and his colleague Melanchthon in Wittenberg and get, came back to Finland and said, I'm paraphrasing, I learned great things. We should, we should do this. We should get these Bibles into Finnish language also, and we should reform our worship to be in Finnish, and we should have a welfare system, and we should teach our kids to read. Oh, by the way, but we don't have a written language yet. Finnish there was no written Finnish language in 16th century. So thanks to Reformation and their desire to teach people and have materials in the vernacular language, the same dude kind of crafted, how do you write in Finnish? So I thank the Reformation for the ability to speak and write in Finnish and to have a, a Finland has a public education. You don't pay a penny for your education. University, you don't pay. Uh, theoretically, basically, welfare, uh, anybody has access to healthcare. These go back to the Reformation principles of, of equality argued on theological grounds. Even though, don't get me wrong, Finland is not heaven, but, but we can see the, the thinking behind the legislation. It goes back to these Reformation uh, century principles of equality. So women benefited from that. Right. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, it's just so hard to even, I mean, this opens up, a, a, a shines a lens on what we take for granted, what we can't even imagine wasn't available, yeah. becoming available, you know, that bridge. Jill, do you want to go ahead with your question? Yeah, Diane, I think you're really going to like this from our women in religion class, because uh, so uh, Dr. Sterna, one of the things that we're learning in, in our women in religion class is about flipping the script. And one of the things I really appreciate in your book on Lutheran theology is where you uh, talk about Mary to illuminate God's manifold working through women as a promise bearers in the story of creation and salvation. You were comparing Eve and, and, and Mary. So my question to you is how as Protestants, uh, how do Protestants view Mary? In, in new ways where you talk about a human body who was fed Jesus with human milk and how we can uh, take that, flip this to why women can be in ministry, why women can be a pastor. Mm, yeah, so, so um, um, to, to get to the question is, I wanna connect a little bit with the previous question. So when we, Look at what happened when the Reformation started taking place. Women lost a whole lot of things. Women lost Mary, as did men, saints, angels, maybe, the convents, 
and visions and mystics. So it looks like from the first glance that women lost a whole lot. So how, how does the spirituality of a woman, let's say a lay woman, and they were all lay women in the time period when there were no women priests and there were no uh, convent women. Uh, how, how would the spirituality look like if these central elements were taken away? And the love of Mary, having Mary as, a, as, an, as an accompaniment, accompanying, accompanying, that has been one of those um, topics um, that for Lutherans, for instance, let's talk about Lutherans, I know more about Lutherans than other Protestants, but the loss of Mary, uh, it, it, went, it went hand in hand with the kind of uh, continuing certain patriarchal structures and theologizing where the feminine aspect that women's experience was not part of where new theology is, is produced. Like, like I said, women received and benefit a lot from the Reformation teachings, but it took a long while before a woman's experience could be seen as insight at, in the content of the theology. And I think Mary is part of this, this, um, this problem because after centuries of Lutheran theology, Mary has disappeared. And as I'm introducing Mary in my class, there's significant sparkle on there. Some of the students in the class, there's a little bit of like, why? Why, why would we evoke this? Because we, there's sort of an amnesia. Or Lutherans have not benefited from any teaching of Mary. We have dismissed Mary just uh, because Mary is human and uh, uh, example of humility. And we are very word-centered, uh, considering Christ-centric. Uh, we consider our salvation um, somehow Mary is, a, is a, as if a, a threat to the justification theo theory that we, we somehow need something else but Christ. Well, what if we say that we do need Mary? What horrible things would happen to a good Lutheran admitting that I need Mary? Um, uh, I was in Boston as a, as a student. I remember went to church there in Unilu Church, and there was a, so it was an advent, and we had for advent, we had banners on Mary, first advent, second, third, fourth, and the advent Mary was, uh, the banner of Mary portrayed a kind of a peasant girl, and in the first banner, Mary was clothed and kind of happy, like, oh, I'm pregnant, and, and, and as every advent Sunday, the banners changed, and then Mary was more pregnant, and in the end, Mary was giving birth, and I was, a, I'm a woman, I was, pregnant and walking under that banner the communion I remember how I felt and I talked to my sisters that we felt the same that we felt embarrassed and weird like there's the mother of God giving birth and I am pregnant and it just felt like something is missing what's the connection here that why do we feel somehow weird and shamed about our body and, and we feel exposed because Mary is exposed in that banner to me that was a turning point in my interest in Mary in, the, in theological terms, seeing that the, the bodiliness of Mary is a good thing. God had God's own wisdom to choose it that way, that savior in Christian teaching comes through a, a woman's real body, not as a, as a kind of a hocus pocus, but as a real birth. So then what does that make of me? And how does that make me automatically relate to Mary because I also have given birth. And then how come after I gave birth, I knew that was the most holiest event I ever been part of. And I felt absolutely powerless. Said, wow, what powerful theological lens this gives me that this is what, what's happened. This happened with Jesus. And, and how come my body still bears the kind of burden of, 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 um, of shame? because centuries of teaching of, about women's bodies in a very anti-body, anti-sex, anti-women ways. So I think Lutherans, I'm sorry to talk so much about Lutherans here, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done thanks to, thanks to um, feminist, womanist liberation scholarship that demands us to pay attention to the feminine experience, also in the divine. And that doesn't mean that we're making Mary God, but certainly more than just the name that we mentioned on Christmas Eve. Um, and and, and uh, those of you who have studied liberation theology know that Mary is uh, uh, controversial also. Mary can be seen as part of the patriarchal oppressive religious culture or Mary can be seen as the liberator. 
uh, and uh, I spent a lot of time in Rome. Uh, I, I love Catholic churches. I love the imagery, and I, I'm drawn to images of Mary. And in Trastevere, in Rome, there is this church of Mary. There are quite a few churches of Mary, but this particular Trastevere, on the ceiling, there's this wonderful, oh, sorry, my hands just disappeared because I have a weird background. A image of Mary who looks like, a, she's, she's as if flying over the church, her arms uh, extended, and she looks like this super powerful queen of the heaven. And looking at that, Mary, as a woman, I, I, I remember to develop a longing, but I want to have a, a, a more female expression of the divine in my life, in my spiritual life. And uh, so I've been, uh, maybe that was my draw to the medieval women originally, as uh, my, I wrote my dissertation on Brigitte Sweden, who also was very interested in Mary. said, so why did she wanted Mary to tell her, show her how she actually gave birth? Birgitta traveled to Bethlehem and prayed for a vision. And then she had the vision and she woke up and thought, well, that was disappointing. It happened too quick. I didn't see the blood and I didn't see the tear. I just saw the baby that what happened? It was too quick, Mary. So to have that kind of reflection from a woman theologian of the 14th century and then have centuries of no reflection on Mary while, and I'm almost done here, go back to Luther. Luther loved Mary. Luther's teaching of Mary, uh, he, he like you mentioned, Jill, Luther explains the salvation promise from Eve through matriarchs to Mary, and may, he keeps his eyes on the body. Luther keeps eyes on the body. The body is good. And the promise that women concretely carried. So shame on theologians who belittle that and say that's not important. End of sermon. <laughs> Does that answer your question at all? I mean, there is a little bit of resistance in class to this, Mary. Is, am I correct? I, I sense a little like. Oh. Thank you. That's so helpful. That's so remarkable. Um, Dr. Pena, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you so much. So, Kirsty, I really appreciate both your historical um, discussion and also your personal reflections and how they come together. It's just really fascinating. Um, I had some questions about your book, which I know you said you're working with the dream team, but that's still like a, a, an astonishing amount of work to bring all those chapters together with all those different authors, even if they're all fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I was curious about how you came up. Did you have like a list of, of people that you wanted to be sure to include? And then you kind of looked for scholars and then you saw like what topics still needed to be covered. So you had those other categories. I'm just curious a little bit about how you yeah. did, did that. Yeah, I was, I studied it um, and I was invited to, to do the project. I actually didn't propose that. Um, um, my first idea was that what would I want to teach with, like as a teacher, what would I want to be included in the textbook that could accompany in, in different classes and as a research tool? And what could be a book that where we could bring the best of the best and bring us the reader to where we are right now in terms of how we read, who we read, what we know, and to have enough diversity in the coverage, thinking of the whole Europe, Europe it's not just one thing, they're different countries, different languages, different politics. It's not one country. <laughs> it never was, never will be. So that was my main thing. And, and um, so I studied mapping of the women I already knew, and, and, uh, but then looking at what has been the uh, more recent research on that uh, topic. And uh, so I went with that and trying to make really the geographic and linguistic coverage uh, as broad as possible. So that they have to be English women, they have to be French women, they have to be Italian women, they have to be Scandinavian women, and, and that way uh, do that. And then to see who are the scholars who have worked on, on these women or related. And um, that's one thing in scholarship, whatever our field is, it's amazing how small the world is. You kind of get to know everybody. If you don't know them today, you know them tomorrow. So never burn, burn bridges because it is a small, small world after all. So really, work. it took a long time, months, to develop the concept and the theme and thinking and then talking to authors like Elsie McKee from Princeton. I think she's just retired. She's a phenomenal, phenomenal 
reform scholar and has done work on Katarina Schützel, worked on her trans, uh, translating her works and editing her works and writing biographies. She really pushed me and said, well, in a good way, she said, why, why this book? What is so new about this? Because there are quite a few books already out there. And like, what is, what is new about this? So the newness is that the coverage and, and starting from no, not just seeing what was the impact of reformation on women, but starting women in the middle. That way, uh, starting the story with women and, and having enough history in the chapter so that a reader who is not familiar with that, that period's history can get the point and to have the first uh, reading the woman's uh, voice in uh, first hand at, at least a sample. Um, working with people is interesting. Those of you who want to edit works, uh, working with people is lovely. And I love working with people. I absolutely love putting teams together. Uh, but it, uh, it took a long time to get everybody's peace in and uh, life happens and pandemic happens and we have children and families and, but it all worked out. And, and I could write another book about how this book came about, get to know people's stories and, uh, and, uh, and there are different ways to collaborate. There are authoritarian ways and then there are more collaborative ways. And I, as a feminist, I believe in collaborative ways and really consider it's our book that I, I had. I felt like I was the midwife, but I had enough expertise that I knew what I wanted to get at. So it's not just collection of people submitting. No, I had a vision what I want there to be happening. Um, so I got to facilitate that and that. Uh, and kind of propose, not kind of, but propose a, a shift in like, okay, from here on, let's not, these, these women are part of the, the learning that everybody should have who studies 16th century, that, that this is it, no excuse. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Dr. That's so inspiring as far as to see your mission, your process and the impact you know, it's kind of the world that, that you have opened up. Um, we probably have time for one more question. If anybody else would like to come forward. Um, Haley? Um, oh, you're on mute. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sterna for the well uh, presenting our presentation for us. Uh, <clears throat> I think our uh, course of theology of uh, freedom of theology is very helpful, you know, for this kind of reformation uh, with regards to women. And uh, I would like to share a little bit about my my context and the way that uh, as, uh, there are some issues uh, with regards to the the roles of both the pastor and the wife uh, in our church, because uh, for for us in 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 our church in American Samoa. Uh, it's uh, women are allowed to ordain. Women are allowed to ordain, but uh, they are not allowed to do uh, pastoral uh, duties mm -hmm. in the church. So like, for example, when, when the pastor is calling to serve a, 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 con a local uh, congregation, there is a specific role for the pastor and the wife. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. So the, the so when the, the wife uh, dies, the wife dies, the pastor has to look for another wife in order for the, this pastoral service to be continued. And that's how it goes for us. But they were ordained as, as pastors, mm -hmm. but their pastoral duties is not to be used in the local uh, congregation. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, one of the issues that we face now mm -hmm. in our church uh, regarding uh, 
the, 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 the equality of roles are for mm -hmm. both uh, the, the men and the women in the, in the church. Yeah. So, so I'm hoping that uh, that your book on the Reformation for women, uh, you know, you mentioned something like that, the equality in roles for both uh, the men and women in the church mm -hmm. with regards to their ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's to return to the first question, why women's studies is so important, for instance, with, let's say, in Lutheran tradition, Protestant tradition, one very concrete reason is that the issue of women's ordination you mentioned, we could yes. look at Lutheran churches globally. Not all Lutheran churches ordain women yet. Okay. No, they read the same Bible, but different argument. And there's a little bit of almost going back, back in some, some churches, there's a more resistance against women pastors. For instance, some of my home, one of the congregations in my homeland, Finland, I, I heard recently there was some grumbling about that they would not, something to, uh, to the fact of uh, resisting women in ministry, even though women have been ordained since 1989, 88, I was ordained 89. Uh, so you would, so something is happening that it's about women's rights, but also other human rights that seems like we live in a time when it's almost like the progress we made, we are in a danger of almost going back unless we hold, a, hold our ground and say, no, 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 we're moving forward. And the study of history is a powerful tool in that. Knowing history allows us to make arguments that actually could be uh, inducing to vital changes in the, in the world today. I really, I really believe that history is our friend in that regard. But yeah, something is happening at the, at the, that some of the issues we thought we already sorted out uh, are not sorted out. And, and we, are, we live in different parts of the world where, where our timetable is a little different. And knowing history and knowing of one another, I think it helps us. Yeah, thanks Thank for sharing. You. Yeah. Thank you, Pele. That was very insightful and very helpful. And so we've come to the end of our hour with Dr. Sternia. Thank you so much. It was just so informative. And um, do you have any last thoughts or how we could continue to follow your work or your classes? Um, yeah. Any suggestions on this topic to continue to, to develop it? Yeah, well, the, so the book will be out in October. October 2022 and uh, hope you uh, we're going to get a copy to our GDU library to, to use and uh, uh, there are there's like 10 years ago there was a lot of interest in women in reformation then there was less interest and now I'm getting quite a lot of invitations to talk about this in different parts of the world actually and uh, and that's a good thing there are uh, Emory University is offering um, they already offered two webinars and one more in April. Well, I'll be talking about the book and Women and Reformation. That's in April, I think April 6th. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, I'm working on other themes too that, um, but very interested in seeing how the book is received and, uh, and uh, used. Uh, we, we hope that it's used in teaching and in, in research as a, as a tool. And, and I hope that this, uh, rambling well rambling on my from my part discussion has piqued your interest because the topic women and reformation it's not necessarily something that you think would i even dedicate a whole course for it i offered it at gtu a couple of times and the enrollment was kind of small that was also i was new to the school and and we were up on a hill it was hard for people to get there but those who took it uh they still talk about that because there's something, it's almost like it doesn't matter is it women or reformation or women in the 17th century, women in the 19th century, putting women in the, in the beginning of the sentence and at the center of the course, it allows you to look at whatever period or topic it is you're addressing from a perspective that's going to change everything else you think you know about the matter. So it's just like, uh, I would encourage you to take courses, even though it may be a little bit off your primary interest, but courses that has women at the center in the first sentence, um, they are those laboratories where really wonderful 
wonderful transformations happen in how we think, how we work, uh, and what we do with the information we gather. So, so we have this great program at GTU, and uh, coming to events like this is uh, it's uh, we no, don't only learn the content, but also get that that encouragement that yes, yes, this is important. That's great. That's a wonderful way to end our, our time together. Thank you so much, everyone.